Hello and welcome. I am the Armchair Audiophile, and today we're going to be taking a first look at the Odyssey LCD-1. Now, I think it's safe to say that this is Odyssey's attempt to take a firm shot across the bow of companies like Sennheiser and Bayer Dynamic, who for the last several decades have dominated the professional recording industry market with headphones like the HD650 and the uh, DT770s, uh, recently the 1990s. But uh, Odyssey has always had a presence in that market, charging one to $2,000, uh, for premium applications. These are $399. They are 90 millimeter drivers instead of 106 millimeter. They are single-sided magnet arrays instead of dual-sided magnet arrays, but they use the exact same membrane material as the LCDX, a similar magnetic topography, and they are similarly efficient with a... Uh, the impedance is either 16 ohms or 13.5. Odyssey lists 16 on the website. They listed 13.5 in their announcement on HeadFi. I've seen reviews quoting both, so I can't really say for sure, but it is between 13.5 and 16 ohms with a sensitivity of 99 decibels per milliwatt, which means that while requiring current like most planars, it should be relatively easy to drive off of almost any source you're gonna be using for serious listening or recording work. This allows entry-level budding creatives, <laughs> including myself, to access this technology at a much lower price and allows Odyssey to compete in a market that they previously have not had uh, a whole lot of exposure to. With that said, let's get down to the unboxing. The first thing that struck me is that there's no LCD-1 specific branding anywhere on the packaging. I'm not sure if that's just for the first run as they're getting these out the door and there will be updated packaging later. It struck me as a little bit odd, but frankly, it's kind of refreshing and it speaks to more of an enterprise targeted product where you know, you'd be ordering five or six of these for a recording studio or a mixing studio and you know what they are. They're not trying to advertise once you've already ordered them, so that's interesting. Packaging remains similarly minimal in design as we move deeper, although the fit of the box is nice. Inside this folder, you get a little bit of documentation, basically a welcome letter introducing you to the concept of the LCD-1 and your warranty slash serial number card. Then we get to the carry case. This is really nice. Uh, immediately this feels really high quality, texture is great, it feels nice and hard, like it's really going to protect the headphones on the go if you're, uh, as these are targeted for, sort of a mobile creative, uh, this is going to be really great. You don't have to buy anything else to get them where you need to go safely. Okay, inside. We have the cable in a nice Velcro pouch. It's a very supple cloth. The right balance of weight. It feels premium without being uh, heavy. It's terminated in three and a half millimeter. Comes with one of these three and a half to quarter inch adapters. I rather like that in this case. Uh, I wish that Odyssey offered a 4.4 millimeter or two and a half millimeter or even an XLR balance cable for this from the factory and I'm hoping that they release one soon because this is a channel agnostic cable as you can see they are not labeled left or right because the uh, both channels are transmitted to both ends and the headphone actually selects which channel it wants at the cup so it's not wired like most cables are, and, and, and a lot of the cables you might already have are not going to be compatible. So while I was taking them out of the box, I found this interesting sort of soft touch, hard cord divider, and it's got a little bit of Velcro on it, and it kind of looks like it sticks into the, the, the carry case to divide between the two cups if for some reason you want to do that. And here we have 
the LCD one. They feel nice in the hand. The plastic isn't cheap feeling. It's not super premium feeling, but overall it feels pretty solid. The spring tension, it, there's no creaking whatsoever. So that's nice. The rotation of the ear cups is very smooth. Again, not particularly heavy in a way that would convey like ultra premiumness. They're not weighted artificially, but they're also not grainy or loose in any way. They feel nice and solid. The height adjusts with a pretty firm click. That was the extender mechanism there. They will lay completely flat. They will fold. They're also extremely light. I used to have LCD2 classics and after about 30 minutes of listening, my neck would start to ache. Sometimes I would even get a little bit nauseous. These are advertised at 250 grams versus 500 or so for the LCD2 classics. So these are half the weight, even uh, possibly less. So I'm not anticipating any issues there. The ear pads, as well as the headband padding, are real sheepskin leather and memory foam. The ear pads are snap-in replaceable as opposed to glued on as they have been on previous LCD series headphones, although there does not appear to be any way to replace the headband padding. Having taken a look at the build, I'd like to get down to what I'm sure you're all really here for, which is the sound. To do that, I've prepared a short playlist on the Hi BR5, and I have the iFi X can here to drive them. Given the rating of the LCD1 at roughly 16 ohms, the X can is rated for 600 milliwatts per channel at this impedance. Okay, I've hooked everything up and fitted the LCD1s to my head. I have a fairly small to average size head, and I required a total of five clicks to properly fit my ears. While the cups do look small in photos, they are a full over-ear headphone. They don't sit on my ears in any way. They're obviously not as massive and head engulfing as the dinner plate sized LCD 2, 3, and 4 series, but um, they will go over your ears. They're not going to sit on them like something like a ThinkSound ON2 or the Sign series. Uh, even though they don't look to be a ton bigger than the signs, they really are, ultimately. I'm going to start things off with Santana's Oye Como Va in DSD. I really like this track for testing in particular because the horizontal imaging is really, really specific. Like, you, the, how, how this track is mixed, you can tell exactly where every instrument is, and that's a really good way to tell if a headphone is giving you a full... Uh, a contiguous, expansive image of your soundstage, or, well, I'm confusing terms, but if it's giving you a solid contiguous image, or if it's giving you more of a three blob or more in the head sort of effect. Well, first of all, I've expanded to a sixth click of extension on the headband. It was a little bit tighter than I felt at first. But now that I've got it extended properly, the clamping force is pretty much perfect. I can move around freely uh, without thinking about it, and it doesn't feel like they're moving around on my head at all. But at least in the first few minutes, the clamping force doesn't feel like it would become excessive. And I am wearing glasses right now, so if it's going to dig, I'll feel it in the back of my ears pretty soon. As for the song, I'm definitely impressed at first listen. Soundstage is about average. Well, maybe a little bit wider than that. The speed is so, so good. The image sort of feels like it's going over my head in an arc. It, it's not a three blob sensation, but I'm not getting it in front of me. It kind of, it kind of is more of an up and over, or maybe straight through my head rather than in front. So they don't present like speakers, that's for sure. Also, the vocals are just stunningly realistic. The way the vocals present is kind of like how they sound on the Aeon Flow Closed, in the sense that they're really, really natural, really, really clear, but you can hear that it's a smaller headphone than a full-size flagship. 
Like, these do not sound as immense and just monolithic as a set of LCD-2s, but they're still 90 millimeter drivers. They don't sound like small headphones, like the T50RP Mark III's and their 40 millimeter drivers, or even the iSign 20's with 30 millimeters. You get the planar flavor, but you can definitely hear they're small. These sound like full-size headphones, just not oversized headphones, which is what I'd say the LCD proper, the full-size LCDs up until this point have sounded like with the 106 millimeter driver. Okay, we're rolling into Paradox by the Riot Jazz Brass Band. This is a good test for, first of all, soundstage. There's just the right amount of reverb for the space that they recorded in um, that you can gauge for the size. Also, there's a lot of horns and percussion going on at once, so you can hear a lot about instrumental timbre. You can hear a lot about how it handles complicated passages. You can hear a lot about impulse response with how precise the percussion is. I also like to use Bad Bad Not Good for that. They have extremely intricate percussion, but that's not quite what we're talking about. Something that strikes me right off the bat, the LCD2 Classic was a notably dark headphone, and around probably three and a half, four 4K, it really, really, really starts to roll off, probably before that, and, or at least there's a dip there that's really significant. These do not exhibit nearly that much mid-range dip or darkness. They sound a lot more balanced in the highs. As of yet, I'm not going to say extremely airy or something. You know, like I'm going to slaughter the Campfire IOs when I release that deep dive sound review, but they do have some of the best, most extended airy treble in the IEM world, and these don't sound that airy, but they sound extended properly and balanced. Okay, we've hit the trumpet solo in this track, and this is where that reverb I was talking about comes in. Um, honestly, even on something like the periodic audio beryllium that I'm working on, this reverb sounds a little bit larger, so the soundstage is a little bit constricted at this point. Not to say that it's bad, just that this is not a soundstage monster headphone. Otherwise, the balance is still excellent. Instrumental timbre is really nice. Honestly, these do remind me more of the LCD X than the LCD 2. Like in terms of outright micro detail and texture, they're not on the same level as the LCD X, but I wouldn't say it's $800 worth of a gap there, you know? Also, the LCD X is over like 600 grams. These are 250, so if you're gonna be mixing or monitoring for several hours, even if there is a 20%, let's say arbitrarily, micro detail benefit to the LCD X, I wouldn't wanna wear that thing for more than 30 or 40 minutes, whereas I could easily see myself wearing these for a full day of professional mixing or monitoring. I know I'll be using them to monitor my videos from now on, that's for sure. The way the multiple horns layer over each other in this track is also really, really nice. Now we're going to go into a bit of a standard. We're going to listen to Take the Long Way Home by Super Tramp. The saxophone that comes in at the intro of this song can be really shrill on the wrong set of headphones. And you all know I like to uh, test for shrillness explicitly because I used to be really treble sensitive and have sort of grown into it. I don't know if that's because my preferences have changed or because I've systematically damaged my hearing to the point that I can tolerate hotter treble headphones, but it's something I do like to test for because it can be a serious deal breaker for me and for a lot of people if there's, say, spike around 6, maybe 8k. Right off the bat, no harshness. Oh, that's a harmonica. I'm an idiot. This is a headphone I find myself turning the volume up on because I'm having a good time. These are very neutral. But not in a boring way. You know, like the HD280 Pros, uh, well, if you look at their graph, they're not all that neutral, if we're being honest, but to the extent that they have a fairly referenced signature, they're, they, they sound lifeless, they're not particularly fun, although they're very detailed. These are very detailed, they're very neutral, very balanced, but because that extension rolls all the way 
down into the sub bass, like deep. These dig really deep, and they're not accentuated in the bass, but they've got that Odyssey house planar bass thickness, like cookie dough batter, like thick, thick like a bowl of oatmeal. And I'm saying that on a Super Tramp song. This is not. Okay, I've gotten what I've gotten out of Super Tramp. So this is a French vapor trap artist. Uh, his name is N X X X X X S. That's five X's. In fact, his website is n5xs.com. And uh, this particular track is called Credit Crisis. This bass just slaps so hard. I'm not gonna do the weird booty hands that I did a few videos ago for this. I am slap. The bass slaps, slaps on this track. And I am not running the X bass bass boost on the iFi here. Speaking of which, if you're curious about this amplifier, I have a review that I put up last week. Gonna shamelessly self plug. Go check that out on the channel. But I am not currently running any trick bass boost at all, and this is still really satisfying amount of bass. Like the Ether C flows, even I, I generally, if I want to listen to something like this track and and have fun, I do need to activate X bass. Whereas these do just enough, like just enough. It's right there. I, I would guess that the ethers probably start rolling off around 35 hertz, whereas these probably just flat. One of these days, I gotta get a fake head and a microphone and start measuring. Let me know in the comments if you wanna see the Armchair Audiophile official measurements. I also wanna note the texture of the treble on this track. There's this spacey, sort of undulating synth that just sounds really great. The, the sense of how it is modulating from a producer's standpoint is so much clearer um, this really speaks to how technically proficient this headphone is as a mixing headphone. Uh, I'm hearing things that I don't fully know how to describe. Really, uh, things that equate more to the settings in whatever digital audio workstation N5XS was using um, to produce this track. The level of detail in that regard is just off the charts. Next up, I'm going to listen to Tycho, Dream is Memory. This is another soundstage test. This is just a massive track, Again, really airy, like notably airy, and uh, also has really slap-tastic deep bass, uh, and it hits both ends of that. And I want to hear how these sound when it's being asked to stretch to both ends of the spectrum at the same time pretty dramatically. The sound of space and the, the, the naturalness of the snare and sort of breathy uh, uh, uh. wow this is pretty much flawless i desperately want to hear the dt1990 now because the price on that fluctuates pretty often but you can get it around 450 dollars pretty frequently and that i think would be the natural competitor here a lot of people are competing with, you know, are putting it up against the 650 or the 6, you know, 6XX, and that's a $200 headphone now. So, uh, not to say that it can't compete from a technical proficiency standpoint, but it's accessible to a much, much broader market than these are, and to the extent that a direct competitor would compete in terms of both performance and price point, I think. It, it, the 1990s are going to be an interesting comparison. Not that I don't want to put them against the 6XXs as well, and not that I probably shouldn't add a set of those to the review set. Honestly, I prefer the signature of these and their just overall performance to the LCD2 Classic. Like, the LCD2 Classic sounded bigger, meaningfully bigger, and, and it increased the dramatic nature of the presentation of that headphone. I would say there's probably a little bit more micro detail, but the the lack of a mid-range dip on this headphone, the way that Odyssey has managed to really smooth out a lot of the places that the LCD2 Classic fails 
from a reference standpoint, to me, this is the better audiophile set between it and the LCD2 Classic, both because the signature is better into the sense that it's more accurate and because you could listen to it for several hours longer without your neck wanting to snap. Rounding out the tests, we're going to be listening to Kraftwerk, The Robots. This is another one of those imaging tests. The intro to this song features a number of synthesizers just performing very pronounced spatial effects, and I want to hear where they get placed. Honestly, I've heard the sense of that sawtooth moving from the top of my head over to my right ear more defined before. Uh, like on the HE400 eyes, actually, I felt like that moved a little bit further down. I still got the sense of that motion, but I have heard it better. Otherwise, the textural information I'm getting about the synths is beyond what I've heard on most other headphones. I don't think I've actually listened to this track on my Aether C Flows, so I'll have to save a direct comparison of that kind of detail retrieval for the full review, but, you know, I'm getting better textural information about these synths than I got on the LCD2 Classic, and it does again remind me a lot more of how the LCD X performs than how the LCD2 performs. Soundstage is also really good on this track. Okay, I think I'm going to I think it's time that we wrap this up. When these were announced, I really hoped that what we were looking at was a $399 mini LCDX. And having listened to them for 15, 20 minutes now, they do, at first blush, come off like a mini LCDX. I'm really impressed. I really enjoy these. Uh, and I'm looking forward to spending the next several days testing them just straight out of the high B, testing them on my desktop rig, you know, with four watts per channel, getting ridiculous, and really kind of pushing the limits, seeing what they can do. I'm definitely going to be pitting them head to head with the Ether C flows, because frankly, I don't have anything in the collection that can really step to these. Uh, I'll probably try the iSign 20s just for the yucks, but I mean, those have to be equalized to sound correct, so I'm not sure how fair it is to compare the iSign 20s against these, given that I'll be using my own personal EQ on the iSign 20s. So to the extent that I can make a verdict before the full deep dive sound review, I will say that these sound plenty worth $399, um, definitely in the same tier as other headphones I've heard at that price point, and above, they they present very similarly to the LCDX, and while I don't think they're necessarily bassy or musical enough for certain consumers, I think that if you are pursuing some degree of neutrality, if that is your preferred signature, or if you want to use this as a tool for content creation, then this is a no-brainer to, at the very least, try out. That's it for me, the Armchair Audiophile, reminding you that life is too short for bad headphones.